I thought ideally we'd have a, a conversation anyway, more than a yeah, yeah. back and forth interview. Things that interest me, and then you'll just jump on those that interest you also. Okay. Uh, perhaps Charles Ives. That's not someone you Not my big, not, not a not big, thing. not a thing for me, you know? Because he's not, I'm having tried and, and, and thought me. No, I just, uh, you know, it's a lot of work. It's a lot, uh, the, generally the, the additions and the parts, there's so many complications for things and nobody knows exactly. And, you know, there are other conductors that really make that a specialty, Michael Tilson Thomas and Leonard Slack, and so I haven't delved down that path much. Do you feel sometimes deprived not getting to do Bach? No, I mean, there's not that, there's not that much... Uh, Bach for orchestra, I'm, and uh, since I was a violinist first, I certainly got my uh, my share of Bach, which is so rewarding to play as a, a violinist. I mean, there's a there's a plethora of music um, in that realm, and I did uh, when I was playing. I every year did all the Brandenburg Concerti, and so I, I I did that for many years, and I'm good. Well, then let's talk uh, Mahler. Sure. It strikes me that, that in Mahler there's a temptation to always give a little bit more and always squeeze a little bit more out of it, of whether you call it the angst or the anxiety or the glaring. When is it difficult to just trust the score and with all its detailed descriptions and, and, and keep back and, and not do that one thing too much that then? Well, I mean, that's a matter of taste, of course. I mean, when you say it's one thing too much, it, that's your opinion as opposed to someone else's opinion. But uh, yeah, I think Mahler is very specific. I mean, it's as though he's uh, right here, you know, on your shoulder. And even uh, people may not be aware, but in his scores, since he was such a consummate composer and conductor, he uh, writes little notes everywhere. It's almost like uh, um, these these little messages in a bottle, you know, that uh, be careful here, don't rush here, watch this, conduct this way, don't, you know, so there's so many um, instructions from Mahler himself that I think if you, if one just is uh, true to the score, I, I think it, it really does almost play itself. But of course, I think, uh, I think Mahler is a composer of excess. You know, he's one of the first composers of excess, and uh, it's important not to exaggerate, but to certainly to express the excess in the context of, of when he wrote the pieces. So allowing excess, but not excessive excess. Well, I mean, but that's, that's how I feel about uh, most most music, most art is that, you know, it, it, my role is to try to be the messenger for the creators. And uh, while, of course, I have a very defined viewpoint, I think if, I, I think it always has to be true to what I believe the composer wanted. And so I have to sublimate my ego to what I believe is the, the greater goal of their piece. And, and with, in the case of Mahler, I think we have to look at the time he's living in and the context of the musical world at that moment. He's about to really push all of the barriers that we've known, I mean, in terms of length of piece, in terms of instrumentation, in terms of effects on the instrument. I mean, when he calls for the bells up and all the woodwinds, I mean, it doesn't get more exaggerated than that, in a way, that kind of sound. Or when he calls at the end of the first symphony for the horns to stand up, I mean, this is very Hollywood, very over-the-top kind of approach. So do I need to tell them to, you know, stand up on the top riser? No. You know, it, it, it just is unto itself really dramatic, and I think some people could say, and certainly at the time I'm sure said, it's excessive. And, and yet within Mahler and doing great Mahler, there's, there's such a bandwidth of possibilities. When we look at the two early paragons of bringing Mahler back, Kubelik and Bernstein, they couldn't have been more different. But that's the, that's the amazing thing about uh, interpretation and, and music is that there's a, I mean, it's, it's, it's the same as reading a book. I mean, the message that I get from an author could be an entirely different message than the one you get. It's a matter of reading between the notes, between the lines, and 
Um, I do think, though, if you listen to Bernstein's uh, work over his career, his vision of Mahler, while consistent, also changed dramatically. And so toward the end of his career, uh, I think he becomes more, uh, more interested in the extremes in terms of tempi and, and, uh, and exaggeration. Um, but I think the qualities that he brought to Mahler of, he was able to capture this spirit of popular music, I think, and, and incorporate that into, you know, and, and also a lightness of existence in Mahler, which is hard to find sometimes. Um, when an orchestra plays Mahler, and, and Schumann and Dvorak in the heavy romantic repertoire, which has become the staple of orchestras like the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra, and to the, perhaps even the OSSB, whose program I'm not that familiar with, and then lots of other orchestras here. Um, is there a danger that there is too much romanticism in the repertoire and that the lightness gets lost that you might have with an opera orchestra when you conduct when they have to do a weekly Rossini or? that perhaps orchestras aren't doing enough Haydn to... Well, I, I, I think it's important to try to balance your one's diet as an orchestra and, and have, have real variety um, to do more classical music. But, of course, when you have... Uh, in Sao Paulo, I have 120 musicians. And so there's also an, just a, a sheer numbers... Um, issue, which is that if I use an orchestra of 40 people, I have uh, 780 people sitting at home. You know, so there's there's just a practicality about it as well. But that's not to say that it it I don't focus on some of the classical repertoire, Mozart, Haydn, uh, Beethoven. I think that's very important for an orchestra, and also to think about that period of music um, in terms of. Uh, early instrument practice, original instrument, you know, to have a, um, at least a knowledge and an experience with that. And often when I have guest conductors, I try to find people that specialize in these areas that can bring a different perspective to the orchestra because I think it does uh, inform, as, as you say, inform the other repertoire. I mean, if you just, if you just constantly have, you know, meat and potatoes, it, you never, uh, you're, you're, body or physique never really uh, lightens up, as you say. So I think it's important to try to balance it. But uh, Haydn is not, uh, it's interesting because I often propose Haydn and many orchestras really are not interested in doing Haydn, which is a shame. Uh, is it perhaps because Haydn is really difficult to do really well? I, not used I don't that. know. I mean, I think when orchestras often have a choice, uh, they'll gravitate toward Mozart really simply because Mozart sells more tickets, probably. I mean, that's what I, that's what I deduce. Uh, you've been uh, with a, se a season and a half now at, in Sao Paulo? Oh, no, I'm starting my third season now. Uh, oh, because they start, uh, their season runs from uh, March through December. So I just started my third season. How has that been? That, I mean, Sao Paulo is far, far away from everywhere else in the world in a way it's surprisingly far. Well, uh, I think, um, you know, there's so many things to say about being uh, involved in Brazil at this moment in history because the country is uh, an exciting, positive, uh, resourceful place to be, you know, and it's on the rise, whereas... Um, you know, the United States and many places in Europe are all in a uh, retrenching and retracting mode right now and trying to, you know, cut back on everything and be careful. And, you know, it's a very cautious moment in history uh, for so many places that being part of a country that's feeling its own um, growth and excitement and pride it's a great opportunity. It, it feels, rather than feeling far away, it feels like more of the epicenter than many of the places I go. It's got an amazing hall with the Sala. Um, Sala Sao Paulo is a beautiful, beautiful concert hall, and the orchestra's excellent, very um, passionate, very committed. Management is fantastic. Board of Directors is um, completely engaged and involved, and they love the orchestra. So. 
and all the concerts are sold out. So it's a, you know, it's got all the right um, elements for me to be involved and be engaged and build for the future. Have you been experimenting with the adjustable ceiling at all? Uh, yeah, a little bit, but you know, I think one of the one of the challenges with these um, um, contemporary concert halls that have a lot of adjustable components is that uh, you you have infinite possibilities, so you never have time to really experiment with everything. And each repertoire, each piece, even uh, has different orchestration, and you could start. You know, it can make yourself crazy, too. I, I mean, there's something I love about great concert halls, you know, from the old days, because they're just great. You don't have to do anything to them. You don't have to adjust. You adjust yourselves. Good. Fantastic. Okay, super. Thank you so much. Yeah, pleasure. All right, perfect.